I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Public Affairs Programs, and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and a special welcome to a few of our trustees who are with us for the first time this morning. Today we have the pleasure to welcome back one of the most perceptive political writers of our time, Timothy Garton Ash. In his recent book, Facts Are Subversive, Professor Garton Ash brings together dispatches from a troubled world. In doing so, he sheds light on many of the defining issues of our era. His aim is to chronicle the history of what he calls the nameless decade. For him, it is a period that began with the terrorist attacks on America in September 2001 and ends with the election of Barack Obama in 2008. Although this time frame is not quite a full 10 years, the essays are diverse in their subject matter and show just how difficult it is to define this decade with an overarching theme. For example, among the many topics covered are those dealing with the upheaval in post-communist countries, authoritarian regimes in Burma and Iran, the challenge to liberalism raised by Islam, the future of Europe, and the corrosive combination of the Bush administration's bungled foreign policy as seen by the U.S. decision to overthrow Saddam Hussein. Combining the scholarship of a historian with a journalist's acute observation and attention to detail, Professor Garton Ash believes that it is just as important to tell the story as it is to have his work be anchored in authority, creating a literature of fact. But what does this mean? He tells us that literature of fact is a type of writing that invokes verifiable truths about the world and presents them in a style of unflinching honesty that he calls veracity. He writes that facts are like mosaics fitting together to compose pictures of the past and the present from which political and historical analysis can flow. For any historian, but especially for one who is revered as much as our speaker, the importance of gathering hard facts to record history is what matters. It is both a political and a moral imperative to find them. Accordingly, it is not surprising that one of the themes running through his book of essays about this period of the 20th century raises such questions as when is it legitimate to cross that heavily mined frontier between fact and fiction? How do we know what people thought they knew when they had to make a particular decision? We live in a time when the sources of fact finding and fact maneuvering have become so intertwined that the line of reality and reporting events often becomes blurred. Even so, sometimes there is someone who believes that the vagaries of the present discourse should not stand in the way of recognizing the facts instead of the fiction. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to that someone who understands the complexities of the international situation and the need for veracity in reporting, a most remarkable journalist and historian, Timothy Garton Ash. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be back here. I hope we won't make those cameras shake, <laughs> although perhaps that's what a speaker really wants to do. Um, and thank you for this lovely introduction, which actually was a, a beautifully judged um, uh, a praise of the book. Um, I, I, let me start with the title, which is Facts Are Subversive, which some of you may recognize as a quotation from the radical journalist I.F. Stone. When I decided to use this as the title for the book, I, I thought, well, I better just double check my source for this quotation, because it wouldn't be a very good start if you called your book Facts Are Subversive, and it started with a misattribution. So, as one does, I Googled it. And I came up with an impeccable source. Um, unfortunately, the source was me. <laughs> <laughs> Saying in some lecture or other, you know, as R.F. Stone said. And I thought, well, yes, you know, fine source, but not quite good enough. So I then contacted um, two of his biographers. His uh, anthologist, uh, Peter Osnos, who I'm sure will be known to some of you, uh, and his uh, daughter, I.F. Stone's daughter, none of them could find it. So for now, facts are subversive is me and not I.F. Stone. <laughs> but I do believe that this is indeed the case. That is my article of faith. If you want a couple of examples, um, you'll find them in the book. Uh, I start with an obvious one, 
which is the facts about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, if the facts about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, or that is to say, the facts about no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq had been known, it is unlikely that Britain, at least, would have gone to war in Iraq. Uh, Blair would not have won that vote in the House of Commons. I, the United States, you can judge better than me. A uh, pretty big example, I think, of where facts are potentially subversive, but there are also the facts over which great men stumble, and great women, indeed. Um, I have an essay in the book on the, the great German novelist, Gunther Grass, who, as you know, quite recently stumbled mightily over the fact that he had, in fact, served in the Waffen-SS in the Second World War, um, which made a mockery of his great lecture to Ronald Reagan and Helmut Kohl about the awfulness of their going to a cemetery to honor the war dead that included very young men who had actually been drafted into the Waffen-SS, as was Gunter Grass. Um, that fact was pretty subversive uh, of his moral lecturing um, uh, 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 about um, to Ronald Reagan and Helmut Kohl, and I could go on. Um, the subtitle of the book is Political Writing from a Decade Without a Name. Uh, it's actually the third book I have done of, of essays collected from a decade. I did a book from the 1980s. I did a book from the 1990s. I refuse to call this decade the noughties. <laughs> I simply point black refuse. It is too cringe-making and toe curling, as I say. It's like putting a pair of frilly underwear on a bull. Um, but also, I say a decade without a name, because actually I think the character of the decade is quite difficult to pin down. It is not clear to me when the historians come to write the history of this period in 20 or 30 years' time, what the chapter title will be. I mean, I think many of us after 9-11 would have said it's going to be the great struggle, or as some put it, war against terror. It's not so clear to me now that that is actually the deeper, the bigger, story of this decade. We could perhaps talk about that. Now, this is a collection of essays. It covers, as Joanne said, a wide range of themes. I'm just going to pick up a few and try and tie them together for discussion. Um, as you know, I've spent much of my life chronicling what we have come to call velvet revolutions. Uh, the peaceful revolution starting in Poland in 1980-81, the great revolutions of 1989. In this book, I have an eyewitness account of the fall of Slobodan Milosevic in Serbia. The remarkable fact that the greatest war criminal of our times in Europe was toppled by his own people in an almost entirely peaceful revolution and ended his days, as you know, in The Hague. I also have an account of the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Um, but one has to say that then came the attempt to make a velvet revolution in Belarus, which failed. Then came the movement of the monks in Burma which was crushed. Then came the Green Movement in Iran, again, an attempt to make a velvet revolution, a peaceful revolution, which, as we know, was very brut brutally crushed. So the story of velvet revolution, as we go into the next decade, is becoming a whole lot more complicated. And we could perhaps talk in discussion about why that is, um, let me just mention briefly, I think, a couple of reasons. One is because it's not only dissidents and human rights activists who can learn from past successes. 
so can Mr. Putin and Mr. Ahmadinejad and uh, Mr. Lukashenko, and that is partly what has happened. It's simply that the dictators have learned too uh, how to combat these kind of movements much more effectively. It's also, I think, frankly the case that as we go, as it were, even beyond the wider West, beyond countries like East Germany or Poland or the Czech Republic, which were clearly part of the historic West, to places like Ukraine and then to Iran or Burma, it becomes much more difficult, and partly it becomes much more difficult. Because if your neighbors are not the European Union, but China, and sad to say India, as was the case with Burma, you're not going to get as much support as you did if you were Poland or, or indeed Ukraine. So that's one part of the story. A large part of the book is, of course, devoted to the story of the European Union, which has a couple of remarkable uh, uh, changes to report. One is the great enlargement of 2004, in which most of the post-communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe now more or less liberal democracies were brought into the European Union. Um, the reunification of our continent. This is an extraordinary success story. There has never been a time in European history where most of the countries of the European continent have been more or less liberal democracies in one and the same political, economic, and security community. We should never forget that, what an achievement that is. I like to say to my British Eurosceptic friends that this is the worst possible Europe, apart from all the other Europes we've tried from time to time. Um, and we have major reservations here, the story of the Euro, also unprecedented, now in very choppy waters. I hope we can talk about that, but nonetheless, a remarkable achievement of the decade are three great challenges, in my view, in Europe. Are firstly, of course, the economy, and more particularly, to create meaningful work, to create jobs in very difficult circumstances, which you know about. I'm not an economist. I'm not going to talk about that much. Secondly, something I spend a lot of time on, to get our act together in foreign policy. Uh, and we spent most of the decade failing to do that. Um, and I think even what we've done now is not terribly impressive. In a world of giants, both established giants like the United States and emerging giants like China, Brazil, India, South Africa, it makes no sense just to be France or Britain, or Germany. Even the largest country in Europe is too small for this world of giants. Even if you have no sentimental attachment to the European project at all, as many in Britain's current government do not, um, the sheer Palmerstonian realism, the pure logic of the argument, must lead you to believe that Europe should get its act together in foreign policy and should, wherever possibly, possible, try to speak with one voice, starting, by the way, with Russia. If we have no Russian policy, there will be no European foreign policy. Uh, so that, again, I hope we can talk about. The third great challenge, and if I may, I want to spend a few minutes on this because I think it will be of interest to you, is the integration of Muslims, of citizens and denizens and mere residents of Europe uh, of the Muslim faith. And the reason this is such a great challenge, I mean, the reasons are pretty obvious to you. You know this, but let me just spell them out. Um, one is demography. And here, your position in the United States is quite different from ours, because as you know, we have these rapidly aging 
native populations. Many of our populations are not reproducing themselves. There's our age structure and a very expensive welfare state unfunded pension systems. So someone's got to support those welfare states and support those pension systems even if they're reformed. That means immigration. Where is our immigration going to come from? Overwhelmingly from the Muslim world, whose demography is the exact opposite. It's a <laughs> demography of Europe turned on its head. That's to say 60% under 30 rather than going on 60% you know, over 60. Um, we have, depending how you count, something between 15 and 30 million Muslims already in Europe. There will be many more because of the rates of reproduction and immigration. Uh, they are not well integrated. They do not, on the whole, feel comfortable at home, this painting with a broad brush. And at the margin, particularly in the second and third generation, not the first generation immigrants, but their children or their children's children, there is an exceedingly alienated, radicalized minority from whom the terrorists come who attacked New York and who attacked London and who attacked Madrid. And the challenge is, that's as it were the cutting edge of the challenge and how do we confront it. And since my views on this subject have in some quarters been maliciously and mendaciously uh, parodied um, and traduced by people like Paul Berman, um, let me tell you what my views actually are. Um, there are, I think, two big mistakes which we in Europe in particular are now making or risking making as it were seriatim, that's to say one after the other. The first mistake was actually to either to bring in a great many immigrants from the Muslim world and then not properly integrate them into a liberal secular society not to treat them, uh, teach them the languages, the civics, the history, not to give them career paths and opportunities into our society. And if you go to the banlieue of Paris, if you go to Bradford, if you go to Kreuzberg, you will see that problem. And then when we woke up to that problem, we turned around and said, oh, well, the way to deal with this is what we're going to call multiculturalism. Uh, multiculturalism meaning in practice that we say, okay, you have your culture, we have ours. You give your daughters into forced marriage, you do genital mutilation, you don't believe in free, in free speech, you go on doing it your way. And what is more, we are going to empower and fund self-appointed leaders of the so-called Muslim community something which very dubiously exists, to lord it over their own communities. So we actually empowered illiberal leaders in our own big cities and societies. And this was a terrible mistake. I'm glad to say in the last 10 years we woke up to this mistake, but then unfortunately people have swung right across to the other extreme, and we're now in risk of making almost equal and opposite mistake, as represented by someone like Kert Wilders, um, which is to say, we are at war with Islam as a whole. The only good Muslim is an ex-Muslim. Um, not only you must you speak our language, uh, abide by our ways, don't even think about building a mosque. Don't even think about erecting minarets. You remember the Swiss voted to ban minarets. The headscarf, tear it off. Um, you've had a little sample of this in New York recently. Perhaps we could come back to that. In the discussion period, um, uh, I, I regret to see that in some respects you've been becoming a little European. 
uh, I would urge you to remain truly American and true to the original founding principles of the United States in this respect. This is the equal and opposite mistake. Because if you say to our Muslim fellow citizens and, and simply residents, the only way to become a European is in effect to cease to be a Muslim, to give up central tenets of your faith, then they will not become Europeans. They will not integrate into our societies. And the problem of radicalization will get much worse, and we will have more terrorists. What should we do? We should walk the Via Media, not because it's in the middle, that's not in itself an argument for or against. Indeed, I remember Nye Bevan once said, you know what happens to middle-of-the-road people? They get run down. <laughs> <laughs> not because it's in the middle, but because it is the right thing to do, which is to say to our Muslim fellow citizens, if you want to live here, you must abide by the laws of the land. You must abide by the central tenets of a free society. You cannot say, uh, I am going to give my daughter into marriage without her consent. You cannot oppress your own children in your own homes and communities. You cannot say to Ayan Hirshi Ali or anyone else, if you say that, I will kill you. You cannot say if you publish a cartoon of Mohammed, you will be killed. And there are literally hundreds of people in Europe now living in fear of their lives. But part two of the message, if you do abide by those basic tenets of a free society, the laws and norms of a free society, then you are free to live as you choose, to practice your faith as you choose, to build your the temples of your religion as we build ours, to wear the hijab as, by the way, many European women until very recently wore the headscarf, the nun's wimple. Um, that way, we will, with luck and with uh, uh, some other forms of integration, including, of course, very importantly, giving people career paths and economic opportunities, integrate the vast majority of the Muslim community. There are in all these communities young men and women, but particularly young men, who rather like um, people on the far left in Western Europe in the late 60s and early 70s, are undecided which way to go. Shall I really join the hard guys, the true extremists, um, sign up to the campaign of, of, of jihad, or shall I get a degree, get a job, and integrate into the society? And what we succeeded in doing with the Bader Meinhof gang and the Red Brigades and others in the 1970s was that double act of catching and hammering and stopping the true men of violence but at the same time, wooing back that undecided, very significant margin of that generation, so that now people who in 1970 were within a centimeter of joining Bader Meinhof are the pillars of German society, lawyers, politicians, and judges. And that's what we've got to do with our Muslim population. Um, and to do that, this is the last point I want to make on this, um, to do that, certainly people must be free to make an offensive argument for their own convictions, including atheist convictions. That is to say, it is a scandal that people who make an offensive argument for atheism against Islam have to go in fear of their lives. But I don't think it is a realistic expectation that the majority of European Muslims are 
as it were, overnight or even within a few months or years, going to take the huge, the really huge leap from somewhat conservative or radical versions of Islam all the way to kind of 21st century European type atheism. Whether or not it's desirable, I don't think it's realistic. So that what is absolutely crucial to the process I've described is actually to have figures in the Muslim community, uh, including thinkers and clerics, who say you can at one at the same time be a good Muslim and a good citizen of a free society, be it the United States or European society. And how they make that argument, and I have to say to you, it's quite a stretch. It is quite a stretch from the now traditional conservative interpretations, let alone radical Islamist interpretations of Islam, to abiding by the basic principles of a free society. But if anyone is going there, that's a good thing. And that is to be encouraged, because I, I see this in Britain's and, and other European Muslim communities. This is what many people in these communities are crying out for, to be told, particularly in the younger generation, to be told, you can do both. Yeah, you can be a good Frenchman, a good German, and a good Muslim. And if that involves a fair bit of fudge, well, so be it. Good for the fudge. And I have to say, the Catholic Church put liberalism on the syllabus of errors in the 19th century. The Catholic Church, as many of you know, fought liberalism tooth and nail for 100 years. And its reconciliation with liberalism, even today, is partial, but it, it works in practice. And it involved a little bit of good old fudge, and good for the fudge. And since it's an even bigger stretch from Islam to reconciliation with liberalism, there's going to be more of that. So creative ishtihad, reinterpretations of Islam, that make it compatible with a modern liberal society. That's fine by me. Um, let me just say, um, and I, as I'd be happy to talk about that further, just mention very briefly two other themes in the book and then throw it over to you for discussion. Um, first of all, there's a good deal in the book about the United States, where I spend three months every year at Stanford University every summer a hardship posting, I have to say, <laughs> but I put up with it. And um, from that rather um, uh, uh, privileged vantage point, um, I've been observing the evolution of the United States over the last decade, and I must say, quite frankly, observing it with some concern. Um, because while Europe has a lot of problems, it also has really some significant achievements, which I've mentioned to point to over the last decade. And I, I, I feel at the end of this decade that both domestically and in foreign policy, uh, to put it no more strongly, the United States has a good deal of ground to make up. And I hope, I truly hope, that the United States does succeed in the necessary reform and revitalization of its own economic and political system to be, and again, a really strong and attractive power in the world, because we need it, and we need it particularly because, and this is my final point, the penultimate section in the book is called Beyond the West. It describes a trip to Iran, a trip to Burma, Hong Kong, China, Brazil. It describes our difficult enemies, but it also describes these great emerging powers. And as the new decade begins, which I will call the 2010s, um, it seems to me that actually the larger challenge to free societies is probably not violent Islamism. Violent Islamism will continue to be a significant problem, comparable, toute proportion gardée, to the problem we had in Northern Ireland for 30 years. In other words, from time to time, 
bombs will go off or you'll have to stop bomb plots, there will be terrorists, there is this problem of radicalization I described. But I, my own guess, and it can only be a historically informed guess, is that the greater challenge to us in Europe and the United States is countries like China and their models of authoritarian capitalism, which unlike Islam, Islamism, offer an alternative model of modernity. They say you can be economically dynamic, uh, exciting, <coughs> modern, but not liberal and democratic. Now, I'm not going to say that will continue to work for the next 10 or 20 years in China. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But at the moment, there is no question that that is the larger, the more dynamic challenge for the world of liberal democracy. You see, in Europe's 20th century, the great challenges to liberal democracy were two, communism and fascism. And both of them in their time were considered alternative models of modernity. Someone famously went to the Soviet Union and said, I have seen the future and it works. Well, now people are going to China. Columnists in American newspapers are going to China and saying, I've seen the future and it works. So that that for me is probably the larger challenge of the 2010s. And this is another reason why we, both in the United States and in Europe, really have got to get our skates on and get our own houses in order. Thank you very much. Um, I just hope that I'll be here in 2020 to welcome you back if we have to wait 10 years. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions, and I just ask that you wait till the microphone comes to you, and please introduce yourself. Um, Mr. Kegley. I'll stay that way. I'm Charles Kegley, uh, retired professor, an author, and uh, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Carnegie Council. Uh, I want to thank you for a very informed and informative presentation. Uh, I've always pictured what you do as an act of deconstructionism because you cover a wide range of discourses, as we've just heard but you're really focusing in on definitional problems. So when you pick this great title, facts are subversive, uh, you have identified, to my mind, uh, a, a, an avenue, an opening, to talk about what are facts? How do we define what is real from what is not real? So let me, uh, <coughs> let me follow that. I was in your country when 911 occurred at Canterbury. I had come out of monastery where Augustine had held forth, thinking very uh, deeply about his theories of just war. And that's when I saw on the screen what had happened. I ended up spending a delightful, you can imagine that, six extra days there. When I came back, the phone was ringing. Uh, one of my publishers asked me to do a sequel to an earlier anthology I had done on international terrorism. Um, uh, that came out in 93, the new global terrorism, subtitled Characteristics, Causes, Controls. Now, on characteristics, I wanted to find someone who knew how to pick a catchy title and, and cut deep and explain the complexities. So who did I pick? Chapter 5, you're in this book. <laughs> and uh, you, uh, I really admire your capacity to invent titles. Uh, this was titled, Is There a Good Terrorist? It's a great essay. Uh, a lot of time has passed since then. How would you answer the same question you pose today? Well, um, if you remember, that essay was about 
a, uh, the leader of the Albanian uh, minority briefly insurgents in Macedonia which looked as if it might, at that point, as if it might be the next um, Kosovo. And that man, who was then, who I had to drive up into the mountains, the past various roadblocks, and uh, uh, eventually found him in his safe house, surrounded by rather sinister bodyguards. Um, uh, he was supposedly a um, uh, uh, a Muslim, but almost the first thing he did was to offer me a very good glass of whiskey. So he was a somewhat liberal Muslim anyway in that time. Um, it was from, from the island of Isla, as a, uh, the Scottish island of Isla, which has some of the best whiskies, as, as some of you will know. So I said in the essay in the Balkans, Isla trumps Islam. Um, but, um, and he was clearly... Uh, weighing his options. They had used limited force. They had made this rising. And he did what Sinn Féin did, what the ANC did in South Africa, what many ex-terrorists with specific national goals have done. They decided they'd get further through politics than war. And so... The answer to your question is the good terrorist is the ex-terrorist, right, who has taken the path of integration and taken his community with him. Unfortunately, as you know as well as I do, uh, the militant jihadi young men, they are mainly young men that we face <coughs> today, are unlikely to be of that kind because their revolutionary goals, like restoring the caliphate, are totally unrealizable in any acceptable political world. So I think there is an important distinction between those who can, in certain circumstances, like Sinn Féin or like the NC, become ex-terrorists, and those who simply have to be defeated. Said, I'm a Carnegie trustee and also a writer now for The Nation magazine. Um, if, we, if we could stay a little on southeastern Europe, uh, say, say what you think about Bosnia, Herzegovina, and what um, Europe can do or can't do, since this touches, it seems, on both the Muslim question and also on the uh, ultimate unity of the European continent. Yes. Um, it's a very good question. Um, it's not going particularly well. I have to say I haven't been there myself for several years so that I can't answer the question in detail. Um, but I, I would say two things. F well, three things. Number one, I agree with you. It is an absolute test case for the European Union. We allowed war to return to the European continent in the 1990s and genocide. Um, we allowed the mess to develop in the first place. Um, if we cannot integrate these relatively small states in one corner of our own, our own continent, what are we good for? And I think it's absurd that the United States, um, I mean, Hillary Clinton has just been you know, in the Balkans herself, has to spend so much time on it. I mean, I think there should be a division of labor in which Europe clearly takes the lead on this. Number two... Bosnia-Herzegovina is not a functioning state, as you well know, right? It has, it's basically divided into the three um, entities. And the problem with the European Union is that it is a union of states. And you can do all sorts of things in the European Union, but the one thing you have to be is a functioning state. And how we get Bosnia to the point of being the kind of functioning state that you can take into the European Union is a huge problem. I don't know the answer to it. It's in an odd way, Serbia, for all its problems, is actually easier because at the end of the day, it is a state, a well-defined state, and it'll get in there. 
Um, so, so I think num number three, for the symbolic politics of the relationship with Islam I've been talking about, since Turkey is going to take a long time and ain't going well, it seems to me very important that we do take in one or two more Muslim countries sooner rather than later. Thank you. Um, Arlette Laurent. Um, the relative, how would you s say um, about the relative non integration of Muslims in Europe, in our Europe? Um, would it be a mainly a socioeconomic problem or a religious problem? And aside from that, when you think of the still difficulty today of integrating, shall I say, East Germany into the whole of Germany, one can perfectly well understand the difficulty of integrating Muslims from foreign countries. I, How would you answer that? Thank you. Um, unfortunately, if you ask about the problems of integration, the answer is slightly sort of all of the above. I mean, you know, we have a bit, but it varies from place to place. So that uh, um, in France, you have actually they've done much better than us in Britain on, on a kind of cultural integration because of the French Republican tradition. So um, an essay I have in this book starts by going to Saint Saint Denis. Uh, the 18th arrondissement, where, where a, a lot of the Muslims are concentrated. And I t speak to a, a, a man there called Abdelaziz El Jawhari. Speaking, he speaks perfect French. And he says to me, I will never forget this. He looked at me, he said, uh, he said I have a message for Monsieur Sarkozy. Moi, moi, je suis la France. I am France, and he said, and this is a hypocritical country, because all we want France to do is to deliver on the promise of the republic, which is that everyone is a free and equal citizen who has an equal chance to get a job or be a president. And that is not the case. And there's a famous story of someone who actually lived in Saint-Saint-Denis, and she wrote 50 job applications with her true name and the address Saint-Saint-Denis, didn't even get an interview. Then she wrote 50 applications to the same employers with uh, you know, Anne-Marie or something and an address in the 15th and got, I don't know, 15 interviews. Yeah, there you are. So that's, that's the, I think, the particular problem in France, which is actually racism in the job market. And, and you know, actually Sarkozy would love to change it. I mean, he's been quite good on this, but it, it's there in the society. In Britain, it's the other way around. In Britain, actually, as you, as you know, if you come to Britain, um, the integration in the job market is, is pretty good. I mean, you know, you're greeted at Heathrow with, uh, by a passport officer wearing a hijab, right? Uh, our problem is that we neglected the sort of cultural civic integration. So that, for example, um, the children of Muslim families in East Oxford, where I live in Oxford, uh, often don't speak very good English. They have no idea about English or British history. They don't know how Parliament works. So we've neglected that whole side of it. Uh, and that's what we have to, um, uh, you know, have to get working on. So it's, 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 um, it, it's all of the above, but the, but the mix, what needs to be done, varies from, significantly from, from, from place to place. Excuse me. Ron Berenbaum, you, you mentioned uh, about the need for a common uh, foreign policy to the extent that it's possible. And then you said, uh, no Russia, no foreign policy. Yeah. And uh, I wonder how that might work, uh, particularly with respect to uh, uh, Russia's uh, obviously authoritarian behavior, its uh, conduct in Chechnya, its uh, economic ties and political ties to some extent with Iran. Uh, so can you tell us how Russia could be uh, in some way accommodated uh, in terms of its foreign policy views with the rest of Europe? Sure. You know, Dean Atchison famously said of Britain um, in, in the early 1960s that uh, Britain had lost an empire and not yet found a role. That is, of course, precisely the case of Russia today. 
And I can tell you, coming from Britain, losing an empire is quite difficult to do. I mean, you get over it in the end. But it, it is, it is a certain national trauma. And, and, and I mean, one has to start by saying that what Gorbachev did was so extraordinary. To give up a nuclear armed empire without a shot fired in anger. That was a remarkable thing for which most of his compatriots have never forgiven him. Um, and so Russia is still trying to work out what it means to be Russia, because for hundreds of years it has been an empire, hundreds of years. It's never been a normal nation state. So I think it's going to take time. And they've got to work it out themselves. We can't work it out for them, but what we can do is to set the terms. And this is what Europe has so spectacularly failed to do. Because we haven't got a European-Russian policy. We've got a German-Russian policy, which is extremely friendly to Russia and in return gets a lot of Russian gas. Uh, French-Russian policy, a British-Russian policy, and Italian. There's a nice joke about Cathy Ashton, which some of you will have seen, which is that, you remember Kissinger's old quip about, um, you say Europe, but which number should I call? And so now there is this number, and, and you, you ring it, and you get a recorded message which says, for British foreign policy, press one. <laughs> for German foreign policy, press two. <laughs> uh, it, in, it, it's still, well, in the case of Russia, it's still very true. And so Russia can divide and rule, and does quite successfully divide and rule. So we need to get our act together and we need to say, here are the terms on which you would have a long-term strategic partnership with the European Union and the West more broadly. And those terms include independence for Ukraine, but they also include uh, you know, a free trade agreement with Russia and a strong strategic partnership with Russia. And then stick to that position and give Russia the time that it will need um, to, re to, to respond to it. But at the moment, the incentives are simply not there for Putin to stop playing his games. Howard Lentner, uh, <clears throat> would you comment on the relationship between uh, the admission, the possible admission of Turkey to the European Union and uh, the solution of the problem of integrating Muslims in, uh, within the, the countries of the European Union? That is to say, would that, if, if the European Union were to turn down Turkey's application, would that make it impossible or difficult to uh, solve the integration problem within Europe, within the remaining Europe, or uh, is there no relationship between these things? There most certainly is, um, and uh, I think it's a, a crucial challenge for the European Union. Um, the message we would send to the Islamic world if after more than 40 years of saying to Turkey, if you um, do the right thing, you can become a member of what is now the European Union, right? And actually, if you go back to the original agreement with Turkey in the early 1960s, that promise is made by Walter Hallstein. You can find it on the web. If after 40 years of repeating and reinforcing this message and encouraging them down that path, we now renege on it, that would send a disastrous symbol, a, a message to the, to, to, to the whole Muslim world. And in particular, uh, since a lot of Muslims, particularly in Germany, are from Turkey, it would also exacerbate the domestic problems as well. So it is something we absolutely have to do. Um, it's still going to take some time. Turkey has a lot of work to do. There are a lot of stuff going on in Turkey, uh, which is actually going in the wrong direction. But that's partly because they no longer believe the European promise of integration. And we have to make that promise credible, I think. Well, thank you very much for your remarks. Could you... Uh just sort of uh, indicate which European leaders you think are playing the best possible role in promoting uh, 
Muslim integration, and specifically with regard to President Sarkozy and your remark a moment ago, sort of praising him. On the one hand, he's of course opposed to Turkish admission to the European Union uh, because it's not a Christian country. He said something like that publicly. And also his treatment of the Roma, uh, which has of course raised a great deal of hue and cry in the European Union. So I wonder if you could comment not only on him, but on other European leaders, and whether you see some that are really taking the lead in what you would like to see happen in terms of integration, and which ones you think are kind of very regressive or not doing what you want. Thank you. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's very funny because I've obviously been talking about uh, uh, Europe on various platforms for a very long time, and the question about leaders almost invariably comes up, you know, pick, pick, pick the good leaders. Um, and it's often quite difficult to answer. Uh, <laughs> Sarkozy made, in my view, a very good start in this respect. Um, what he said was, if you play by the rules, <coughs> if, you, if you observe the laws and norms of the French Republic, you too could be president. That's exactly the right message. He had several, as you know, Arab stroke Muslim members of, of, of his first cabinet. Um, but unfortunately, um, he hasn't stuck to that. And what I think is happening now, as you know, his, his, his popularity ratings are right down. Um, the, the, um, the Stimmung in Europe, the, 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 the hostility to Muslims is quite strong, and he's tacking to the right. It's obvious. It's absolutely clear, and his support on the ban on the burqa, which I think is totally ridiculous, I have to say. I mean, outside certain specific contexts, like the classroom, where I think it's justified, uh, is, is an evidence of that. So I think he started well, but hasn't done so well of late. If I had to name one leader, uh, um, um, I do think that the British Conservative Liberal Coalition government is pretty good on this issue, actually. Uh, and I would you know, suggest that you might like to look at what they've been saying on it. I mean, they have several Muslims, including Muslim women, in leading positions who are very eloquent um, uh, spokesmen for integration. And what's interesting in this respect is that um, very often minorities historically have started on the left and then moved right. But because of the social conservatism of the Islamic communities, a lot of British Muslims are actually feeling more comfortable in the Conservative Party uh, with their sort of social conservative message. Um, and this is a very kind of positive development in terms of integration, so that you have, as it were, more liberal Muslims in Labour and more conservative Muslims with the Conservatives. So that um, I think that's, that's an encouraging sign. But then, as you know, it's a very undemanding thing to be to be British, you just have to be able to talk at great length about the weather <laughs> and, you know, cricket or now football, and that's about it. Uh, Richard Belcourt, International Journal of Intelligence. Uh, pre 1989, uh, most of uh, Eastern Europe, then under the Soviet bloc, uh, resisted, for various reasons, the immigration of Muslims. Uh, since then, they have still pretty much kept up the barricades. For various reasons, as they look at what has happened in Western Europe, they're still saying, we really don't want them here. We've got enough problems. Can you see, over a period of time, as Western Europe becomes more Muslimized, you might say, or Islamized, uh, that these countries will move a little bit back toward the Soviet Union, feeling that for self-protection, the Russians have created themselves an image of being tough against the Chechens. Uh, and they'll say, look, for demographic and perhaps even economic purposes, since Russia is becoming quite aggressive in that area, that we'll see a kind of recreation of the division between West and East in Europe. Um, I can answer that question quite shortly. No, <laughs> uh, I don't. Um, uh, the, these, I mean, with the exception of the Balkans, which we talked about, but if you're talking about East Central Europe, um, of course, their, their record on um, 
on tolerance of minorities is not impeccable, uh, um, uh, one might say, both historically and in recent times. And if you look at the way the Roma have been treated in many of these countries, that's a very good example of that. But, um, but they don't have this problem in the same degree because right next door in the former Soviet Union, um, they have a vast reservoir, if you will, of um, young, eager, relatively well-educated uh, potential immigrants um, whose skin color is you know, not dissimilar to theirs and who are mainly Christian, maybe Orthodox, maybe Union. So, you know, Germans have Polish nannies and Poles have Ukrainian nannies. Um, so it's a very different, I mean, it's just factually a very different position. And what they will be pressing for will not be reintegration of Russia. It will be the precise opposite. It will be the integration of Ukraine and Belarus into the larger European Union. So in that respect, I think they have a, you know, they're, they're relatively well off. Last question. Uh, Ernest Rubenstein, uh, as the Soviet Union was dissolving, uh, President H.W. Bush and his Secretary of State gave explicit promises to Gorbachev that NATO would not be extended into Eastern Europe. In 1996, uh, facing a possibly difficult re-election campaign, President Clinton violated that promise, which was never documented, it was never reflected in treaty, uh, and uh, led the admission of Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic into NATO. To what extent do you think that broken promise uh, is behind the rather uncooperative policy of the Soviet Union today, uh, Russia today, uh, toward uh, US interests? Um, with respect, I question your premise. Whole libraries now exist on the question of whether a promise was made and to what and by whom. And the closest we seem to have come to it is probably Jim Baker with a somewhat um, elusive lawyer's formulation, uh, which the Russians certainly believed uh, to have been a promise for no NATO enlargement, but a good lawyer might have interpreted otherwise. Um, I think enlarging NATO was the right thing to do. The curse of modern European history has been that in the West you've had strong alliances and in the East you've had weak alliances and wars. So to put everyone together in a strong alliance was the right thing to do. I do not think that if we had not enlarged NATO, Russia today would be sweetness and light, right? I really don't. I think that getting over the trauma of the loss of empire would have been very difficult for Russia anyway. They would have wanted to claw back anyway. Um, what I think, um, you know, the other part of the promise we made at that time, which genuinely was made by Helmut Kohl, was the promise of far-reaching economic integration, economic cooperation with, with then the Soviet Union, now Russia. Interestingly enough, Germany has to a significant extent delivered on that promise. There is now an economic special relationship between Germany and Russia, which is one of our problems in the European Union. Um, but, but I think we did deliver on that one. But may I say in closing, it's been a, it's been a great pleasure um, to, to be with you this morning. I don't think Russia is, you know, in the larger picture, um, one of our bigger problems. I think it's a regional problem, not a global problem. I think the global problems have to do with the Islamic world and the emerging powers like China, so that in the longer term, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about, about Russia too, which is perhaps an unusual note to end on, being optimistic about Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much.